Welcome to the Siebes Knowledge Podcast, produced by China Europe International Business School. On this episode, we listen in as former WTO Director General, Siebes Distinguished Professor, and Notre Europe President Pascal Lamy discusses the current state of global trade during a recent masterclass at Siebes Shanghai campus. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, before I jump into my uh, topic, uh, let me first say how glad I am to uh, spend this uh, week at uh, CIBS as a professor. First, because uh, CIBS is a success story in uh, EU-China cooperation uh, that deserves to be celebrated. Second, because I'm happy to share some of my knowledge and uh, experience uh, with uh, faculty and students uh, here. And third, because I've always thought that uh, teaching is also learning. And I consider that uh, keeping learning at my very advanced age uh, is a huge privilege, which I'm happy uh, to share with you. This being said, uh, let me now turn to uh, uh, tonight's topic, is open trade in danger? This uh, question probably uh, would have looked awkward 10 years ago, or even five years ago. And yet, it's now uh, every day uh, in the news, usually uh, triggered by some uh, new tweet by uh, Donald Trump. <laughs> so I will uh, address this uh, question in uh, three steps, uh, following a classical Cartesian approach. Uh, first, where do we come from? Uh, second, uh, where are we? And third, uh, where should we go from here? Now, starting with the uh, first step of my remarks, for several decades, open trade uh, benefited from a convergence of several factors. During that period, uh, trade opening uh, was a growth engine uh, with uh, five cylinders uh, working uh, together. These uh, five cylinders were doctrine, uh, action, technology, uh, finance, and uh, results. Starting with uh, doctrine, uh, during that period, there was a broad consensus that uh, opening trade, i.e. reducing obstacle to trade, is uh, the right way to go, to grow economies. It's a win-win game. If I do something uh, better than you do, and if you do something better than I do, uh, we both have a rational interest in uh, trading together, I will benefit from your know-how, your productivity. You will benefit from mine. That's a win-win game. And it was uh, theorized uh, by uh, Mr. Ricardo uh, quite a long time ago. And then the theory was complemented uh, by uh, Mr. Schumpeter, uh, who explained how this worked to create efficiencies. Of course, if I trade with you things which you do better than me, and if you trade with me uh, things uh, which I do better than you, the people who consume what you produce better than me uh, in my country will be happy. They will benefit from lower prices. But this is to some price, which is that the producers in my country who produce what you do better than me will not be happy, and the other way around. In other words, the doctrine of opening trade is, of course, that it's a good thing because it creates efficiencies, but to the price of pain 
for those who have to adjust to this uh, new uh, competitive uh, situation. That's the theory. That's the broad consensus why opening trade was, uh, during all this period, the way to go. And of course, for this to work, you need uh, two basic conditions. You need international trade uh, to uh, take place in reasonably fair conditions, i.e. with a reasonably level playing field, so that the rationality of we trading together is not distorted by unfair comparative advantages on the one side. And then, of course, you need domestic systems uh, to address the pain which these efficiency creation generate. Because it works because it's painful, and it's painful because it works. So the consensus was that, that the right way to go, plus we had to meet these two conditions, one at international level, and the other one at domestic level, through proper social security systems, or let's say systems that help reducing uh, social uh, insecurity. So first, cylinder this doctrinal consensus. Uh, second uh, cylinder was the fact that action followed doctrine uh, during uh, most of this period. Markets were opened progressively and rules were created in the international system in order to guarantee a maximum of fairness in the development of international uh, trade. If you look at a number, I mean, 40, 50 years ago, uh, the average uh, tariff worldwide was, what, 30, 35%. It's now uh, down to 5% in trade-weighted terms. So a big, constant reduction of obstacle to trade, uh, the purpose of which was uh, to protect producers from uh, foreign competition. In the meantime, welfare systems have developed in order to cope uh, with the pain I was mentioning, although these uh, welfare systems, because they are domestic, they are generated domestically, because they pertain to some sort of sense of solidarity uh, between uh, winners and losers of uh, trade opening, were developed. They're not the same everywhere. They are much more developed, for instance, in US, in EU than they are in US. But still, at least in the development world, a system was put in place that was properly coping uh, with the uh, losers part of the equation. So that's the second uh, engine uh, that was uh, working together with the first one. The third one was technology. During this period, technological progress helped reducing uh, the cost of distance, uh, which is a big contribution to the expansion of international trade. And if you look at human history, uh, you will see that uh, each of the big waves of globalization was generated by a jump in transport technology, uh, starting uh, with uh, being able uh, to cross the Atlantic uh, in the 15th century, uh, the moment you started uh, allowing uh, ships uh, to uh, sail other than just by rear wind, then you had the steam revolution, then you had the electricity revolution, then you had the plane revolution, then you had the internet revolution. Each time, a jump in transport technology helped crushing the cost of distance, which in many areas is the main limitation to the expansion of world trade, because it's fine to be able to sell something which you do better 
than somebody else, except that if that person is so far away that you have to bear a, a big cost in order to do that, this, of course, eats most of your, if not all of your comparative advantage. As a result of that, the production systems of goods, of services, and to some extent uh, the circulation of people uh, have uh, been uh, facilitated by this constant reduction of the cost of distance. That's the fourth uh, cylinder. Uh, finance is, uh, that's the third cylinder. Finance was the fourth cylinder. During all this period, uh, liberalization of capital flows, deregulation of some uh, financial systems uh, in some countries led to a big oiling of international trade through a finance system, whether it's about trade finance or whether it's about uh, the financing of investment that allowed a number of foreign operators to invest in foreign countries in order either to produce down there or to sell uh, from uh, abroad. And of course, that was the period where the financial industry uh, globalized uh, extremely rapidly. And finally, uh, last uh, cylinder, uh, which also was uh, pulling in the same direction as the others, uh, was that this led to impressive results in the contribution of the expansion of international trade uh, to the growth of uh, the economies. In many countries, this spurred growth, fostered growth. This led uh, to an increase in uh, welfare, thus mitigating uh, the uh, winner-loser problem. Uh, the moment there are many, many winners, and there were many, many winners, that did not mean there were not losers, but the voice of winners uh, was uh, larger than uh, the voice of losers. This is true as well for developed country as uh, for developing country. And the result also was this sort of multi-localization of production process, uh, which uh, we, in our trade jargon, uh, call global supply chains. And this is a movement where, starting from a situation where a country would produce something and export it to another country, uh, the country would specialize not in one fabrication of one product or service, but on a bit of a segmentation of production systems. Instead of producing a car in one country and exporting it to another, uh, cars now, on average, on this planet, are produced approximately, on average, in uh, 20 or 22 countries. Countries specializing where they have a comparative advantage in the production of a bit, a part of the car, uh, which is uh, the system where, in reality, you don't trade, uh, except at the final uh, stage of assembly, uh, you don't trade something, you trade a task that contributes to uh, the production of this something. So these uh, five cylinders uh, were working together. Uh, I've called that in a book I published in uh, 2013, the Geneva Consensus, which is how to make sure that trade opening works and works uh, to the benefit of all. These conditions were working together. This is uh, the period of what uh, one could call uh, the period of a happy globalization. And the main historical uh, dates or references uh, for that uh, are, uh, for instance, uh, the moment uh, the Berlin Wall uh, fell in uh, 1999. Uh, uh, the moment where the World Trade Organization was uh, created uh, in uh, 1994, or even uh, the moment 
uh, when uh, China joined uh, the uh, World Trade Organization in uh, 2001, thus giving an overall impression of uh, convergence through the expansion of uh, international uh, exchange, which is the sort of best and shortest definition of what uh, globalization uh, is about. So it was a good period. It was a happy period. Uh, I mean, a few nuances. Uh, nevertheless, in some instances, there were manifestations of uh, some sort of uh, anti-globalization uh, uh, attitudes in some quarters. Two examples of that, uh, the uh, breakdown of the uh, multilateral uh, investment agreement uh, at, the, at the end of the 80s, which was a, a multilateral regime of investment rules that was uh, negotiated uh, within the OECD, and that, at the end of the day, did not come to life because of uh, oppositions, uh, mostly uh, by civil society movements. Another example of that, uh, which I remember full well, uh, because I was there, uh, is uh, the breakdown of the Seattle Conference uh, in 1999, which failed in launching a new round of uh, WTO uh, negotiations. These are blips, uh, not the major uh, picture, but blips that show that this consensus was not a total unanimity, although, although uh, the reason why at the time civil society organization uh, opposed globalization and trade opening uh, was because their view, their thesis, was that this was bad uh, for developing countries, which, of course, uh, looking uh, a few years uh, later, uh, was uh, full wrong, because it's pretty clear now, with a sort of benefit of distance, that uh, this period of trade opening and consensus on trade opening uh, benefited a lot to developing countries. And I think uh, saying this uh, in uh, China uh, is uh, stating the obvious. That was good old times. Uh, I think the reality is that this uh, convergence, this consensus, uh, is now uh, on the strain if you look at uh, recent development, uh, I think one can say that looking at these uh, my five uh, cylinders, which were working uh, so well together in the previous period, uh, now each of these five cylinders have their problem, and the engine has lost a lot of power. Starting uh, with uh, finance, which, remember, was one of the cylinders. Uh, and that was uh, when uh, the uh, US uh, financial system uh, exploded at the time of the uh, subprime uh, crisis in 07-08, uh, which led to this big financial global uh, economic uh, crisis. Uh, which has left very serious and very uh, severe and uh, lasting consequences in many countries of this planet. Recessions in some countries, shrinking of public expenditure in other countries because a lot of public resources had to be pumped uh, to uh, restructure the financial system which had uh, gotten uh, bankrupt, uh, some bits of deglobalization in the financial industry. The reaction was to re-regulate the financial industry, and re-regulating the financial industry had led to a re-clustering 
of the uh, financial industry, uh, which was uh, declustered uh, in the uh, previous uh, period. It also led uh, to uh, structural changes, like what happened here in China, uh, where uh, after years of trade opening and liberalization, uh, where the state-owned enterprise uh, sector uh, had been shrinking, on the occasion and because of the financial crisis in 08, the Chinese system, in order to cope uh, with uh, this uh, crisis, uh, restarted growing the part of the Chinese economy uh, which is uh, under uh, state command. This is one of the consequences of the uh, 08 crisis. The second cylinder that uh, ran into problem uh, was the action cylinder. Uh, the reality being that uh, during uh, this uh, more recent period, action has become less efficient, both at international level and at the domestic level. At international level, while WTO was very successful during the financial crisis uh, to avoid a protectionist reaction, which is what happened uh, in the 1930s in uh, similar circumstances. So WTO was quite good at keeping trade open, uh, but it, become, it became less good at keeping opening trade. And you can see that uh, in the fact that uh, the Doha Development Agenda, which was uh, an agenda of modernization, of updating of the WTO system uh, did not come to fruition. We nearly got there in uh, 2008, but because of a last minute uh, disagreement uh, between uh, US and India, which was basically a US uh, problem, uh, then uh, the negotiation could not conclude and has not concluded since, even if bits and pieces of uh, the agenda of the negotiations uh, have uh, come into force uh, in the meantime. But the reality is that we today have a WTO rulebook that dates from 1994, which for some aspects, and I'll come back to that later, uh, is not in sync, not in line with developments which have happened uh, during this period, uh, either in the world economy, or in geopolitics, or in geoeconomics, or even in uh, technological uh, developments. So a less efficient capacity to level the playing field and open trade. And that is also true uh, for uh, what has to be done in order to properly distribute the benefits of open trade domestically, as I already said, the financial crisis led to a damaging of uh, many social systems, uh, whether in Europe uh, or uh, in US, uh, which has left more people losing from open trade than in the past, or more precisely, the number of losers might not have been bigger, but the treatment of losers was harsher, thus creating uh, political frustration, uh, miscontent, hence the beginning of this sort of populist anti-trade stance, uh, which uh, we have seen uh, mostly uh, in US, uh, but also uh, to some extent in Europe, although, although uh, uh, to a lesser extent. We all know that uh, in 2016, as a consequence of that, uh, the US elected a, a protectionist president. Mr. Trump did not invent his trade stance after he was elected. He campaigned on a protectionist platform uh, which in the United States of America had not happened uh, since 1900. So it was a sort of extraordinary development, 
but it showed that a part of the US population had turned pro-protectionist and anti-trade. This is not, if you look at polls, the majority of Americans. If you look at polls, the majority of Americans still believe that opening trade uh, is good uh, for the US. The problem being that this is not the view of Mr. Trump, and this is not the view of every vocal, strong, angry minority, and notably uh, in the Rust Belt, uh, where he did uh, his nicest score uh, in areas which previously were not under uh, this uh, sort of, of political color. So there was a big change in some places. People were so unhappy that they turned the table down in uh, electing uh, Mr. Trump. In Europe, we do not have the same phenomenon. It's not the same way. These people have not found a sort of uh, political genius uh, like Mr. Trump, uh, who I'm sure is not an economic genius, but probably a political genius, uh, like uh, we have uh, different sorts of genius in our civilizations, uh, some good, some uh, less good. But even in Europe, there are some countries where a relatively substantial minority of the population has started believing that opening trade may be good for the others. That's good for them, but not for them, which then creates uh, inequalities. And this feeling of inequality, the notion that it's because of trade opening that inequalities have grown, has gained a political posture in uh, many countries. Hence, the hesitation or the reluctance of governments today uh, to move where they were ready to move uh, in the uh, previous period. The other uh, cylinder uh, that uh, started having problems as a consequence of that is the one about results. I told you that in the previous period, results would come according uh, to the theory. Uh, for the last uh, five or 10 years, uh, growth has been lower, notably as a consequence of the financial crisis. As I said, inequalities uh, have increased, and these populist reactions are now uh, spreading uh, in uh, many countries, thus leading uh, to these uh, more protectionist uh, attitudes. The fourth uh, cylinder also started having problems. Uh, the fourth cylinder is the one about doctrine, uh, it's a sort of consensus that this is broadly uh, the way to go. Uh, starting by a big questioning of the previous doctrine in one place on this planet, uh, which is Washington, uh, as I already said, uh, following uh, the election of Trump, who has a very specific view of trade, uh, which is totally outside the consensus, uh, I was uh, briefly uh, describing. Uh, Mr. Trump uh, is somebody that do not believe that trade is a win-win. He believes that trade is a zero-sum game, uh, as if uh, the US was a big uh, real estate company, and as if the name of the game, like in the real estate, which is the business he knows, uh, was uh, to uh, buy uh, cheap and sell pricey, uh, and that's the way to go. And that's the way business should be conducted. If uh, I win, you lose, uh, and if I lose, uh, you win. This is totally at odds with the doctrine and the theory of open trade, but it has, it had, a few uh, supporters a few centuries ago, and that was called the mercantilism. Uh, mercantilism is a doctrine according to which, roughly, uh, exports are good and imports are bad, which is what Mr. Trump believes, and notably because he has a sort of obsession 
uh, about uh, the US trade deficit as if the US trade deficit was a trade problem. I mean, most of us know that the US trade deficit is not a trade problem. It's a problem that stems from a structural difference uh, between the US and the rest of the world, according to which US consumers consume more than average and save less than average, which then creates a uh, deficit in the uh, external uh, trade balance. But this is something which he doesn't see the way normal economists do it. So he is a mercantilist. He believes for the US, multilateralism is a problem. Uh, he's personally convinced that the US are better off in a bilateral trade relationship. Because he believes in a bilateral deal, the US supremacy will allow the US to get advantages which it will not get around a multilateral table, hence his reluctance uh, towards a multilateral system and his bias in favor of bilateral deals. This is, for instance, uh, why he stepped out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which had been uh, negotiated uh, by the previous uh, administration. So this is a rupture, a clear rupture, uh, with the previous consensus. There's another area where the doctrine of opening trade is changing and has to change, uh, is because uh, opening trade uh, today and tomorrow is not exactly what it was yesterday. Yesterday, opening trade, i.e. reducing obstacle to trade, was mostly about reducing or getting rid of measures, the purpose of which was to protect producers from foreign competition. As I said a moment ago, these measures that protect producers are now relatively marginal in historical terms. Does this mean that uh, trade is uh, now totally open? No. Uh, because uh, if I want to, let's assume I'm a Rwandan uh, producer of uh, flowers, and Rwanda is a country where there is a lot of sun, uh, the soil is very rich, and uh, wages are very low. So it's a big comparative advantage for producing flowers. I will have zero duty, zero quantitative restrictions to export my flowers uh, to US or to EU or to Japan, who are rich markets, who buy more and more flowers because the middle class uh, consumes uh, much more uh, flowers uh, than uh, poor people, uh, and rich people consume much more, much more, much more flowers than the middle class. So it's, it's a great business. Except that my flowers will not cross the US border, or the EU border, or the Japanese border, if they exceed a certain maximum pesticide residues. This is not to protect American producers of roses, or European producers of roses, or Japanese producers of roses. There's not a big comparative advantage to produce uh, uh, roses uh, down there. It's just because US, EU, Japan want to protect the health of their citizens. And doctors, scientific people, have determined that above a certain level of pesticide residue, this is bad for health. And this is my example about flowers, but it's also true for lighters, for toys, for food, for the size of bumpers on cars. The reality is that more and more of these measures, the purpose of which is, again, not to protect producers, but to protect consumers, are rising uh, with the aging of the population in these countries and with the demand for precaution uh, that stems uh, from uh, the uh, social system. Back to my uh, example of roses. The situation would not be that a problem for me 
if uh, the pesticide residue in the US or in uh, Europe or in Japan was the same, or if it was administered the same way. The problem is that this is not the case. US doctors may not have the same view as European doctors or as Japanese doctors on what is the right level of pesticide residues. So they'll set up different systems. They will have uh, machines that uh, weigh the pesticide residues at the border, which are different. And by the way, getting a certification uh, for my roses uh, will be a different process in each case which means that the normal comparative advantage theory that I have good production facilities for roses, which allows me to reach out to big markets because trade is free, does not work. I have either to segregate the production of my roses, so roses for US, roses for EU, roses for Japan, which is these economies of scale, or there's another solution, which is that I produce my roses at the highest standard, but then I might not get the price which I get for the highest standard in the country which asks for the lower standard. So this is a problem. And this problem is growing. My own uh, farm uh, evaluation uh, is, uh, as I told you a moment ago, tariff-wise, if I want to export an average good in an average country of this planet, I will pay 5%, which is not much. The cost I have to engage in order to cope with different regulatory systems in different countries is probably of the tune of 20%. So non-tariff measures, are probably in the world of today four times more important than tariff measures uh, in, uh, in trade obstacles, which raises, and I'll come back to that later, a whole series of problems while recognizing that in some cases uh, there may be a gray zone uh, between uh, protecting uh, the producer and protecting the consumer. Uh, and this gray zone is on the uh, review in the World Trade Organization. Everybody knows that if I try to export a locomotive to Russia, uh, that will not work. Russian locomotives have uh, standards that basically create a situation where only Russian producers can produce Russian locomotives, and you will not be able to export your locomotive uh, to Russia. But this, there are a few cases of this kind, but this is limited. The reality that we have a series of obstacles to trade that result of the differences in the way precaution is administered. It's not the precaution itself which is the problem, it's the differences, hence uh, leading uh, to a series of, uh, of difficulties which were not there before. And these difficulties stem from the fact that these precautionary standards these regulations, these certifications, these conformity procedures stem from collective preferences uh, which are framed by culture. Uh, this is risk management. It's a scale uh, between something which is good and something which is bad, which is what risk is about. And this scale between good and bad is heavily influenced by philosophy, by tradition, by culture, sometimes by religion. So these issues are a much more difficult material to handle than classical trade opening, where if it's about reducing my tariff on bicycles against your tariff on scrap metal, bicycles and scrap metal are ideologically reasonably flat worldwide. A bicycle is a bicycle roughly for everybody. Scrap metal is scrap metal roughly for everybody. It's different if it's about health, for instance, or it's about uh, safety. So the consensus we previously had is also uh, this uh, here eroding. Finally, uh, on the last engine, uh, my five engines, which was a technology, uh, in the previous period, no, technology was basically a solution. 
that helped facilitated trade expansion uh, because of the reduction of the cost of distance. We now are in a period uh, where technology is not only bringing solutions but problems, uh, and notably as the economy uh, dematerialize as we move and we move more and more towards uh, digitalization, the raw material of uh, the digital economy is data. And this creates a situation which we will have uh, to address uh, considering, for instance, today, that the administration of data, the access to data, the protection of data, the localization of data is a very fragmented world. Uh, you basically have uh, three different systems. A US system uh, where data is uh, to buy and sell. Uh, you have the EU system where data is something that belongs to individuals. It's part of public liberties to have your own data protected. And of course, you have the Chinese system, uh, which you know uh, better than I do, where the state and uh, the connection uh, between the state and the party have access to all data that are collected, which is a very uh, different system. In this new world, the notion that you can level the playing field and get the benefits of a global system uh, will not obviously accrue the same way, and I'll come back to that. Add to these problems which uh, each of the cylinders uh, have and are having, uh, add of course uh, something uh, which uh, we know has been there for a long time, but has taken a specific stance since Trump was elected, uh, which is this uh, rising rivalry uh, between uh, US and China. Not that the problem of China growing, becoming a major world power, thus relatively diminishing uh, the US uh, supremacy was not there before. It's been there since China decided to rejoin uh, the consensus I was mentioning on opening, on growing its economy through uh, liberalization. But for a long time, these tensions were low. This has changed. Uh, with the uh, new U.S. administration, uh, which has moved from a sort of Kissingerian approach, according to which the rise of China was inevitable, that this would mean a new relative power distribution uh, between uh, U.S. and China. But the name of the game was to do this in a controlled, in a managed way, in trying to convince China that as it grows and becomes a major world power, it has to take responsibilities of a major world power. The whole theory of China becoming a responsible stakeholder uh, of the, financial, of the uh, global system, to use the words of my uh, good friend uh, Bob Zodik. Uh, but of course, in order to do that, the U.S. needed to keep the West together. And that's roughly uh, the policy posture that has been uh, followed by previous U.S. administrations until uh, Trump was elected. And this led to a very serious change of attitude. Uh, Trump, if you read uh, what uh, his uh, vice president said at the Hudson Institute uh, roughly three, four months ago, where he gave a public lecture on why China is a danger for the US, 
or even if you read the speech with uh, uh, his new uh, Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Pompeo, uh, gave in uh, Brussels last week, the US view is that it's not anymore about containing China, it's about curtailing China. It's not about, about controlling the rise of China, it's trying to push back and make sure that China's problems are bigger than they were thanks to US action. And the way to do that, if there is a logic, and I think there is a logic, is uh, starting from a reality, which is that China's legitimacy, both domestically and internationally, lies in its growth performance. I still travel 400,000 kilometers per year. I go everywhere on this planet. There are places where people like uh, communism, uh, others don't like, some like democracy, others don't like. There's one thing which everybody recognizes, which is that the growth performance of China for the last 30 years has been totally outstanding. And this is where China and the Chinese regime derives its legitimacy, including uh, domestically, uh, if I may. The reality is that this outstanding growth performance owes quite a lot to international trade. A lot of Chinese growth was generated through export and China cleverly using its comparative advantage, notably at the beginning of the sequence where China was benefiting from uh, a comparative advantage in uh, low labor costs in labor intensive industries. This is still the case. And in my view, it will still be the case uh, for the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Not that the Chinese growth is not also powered uh, with an increase in domestic consumption, but still, in absolute terms, Chinese exports will continue to grow uh, in uh, the times to come. Uh, the, it is true that the, US, the Chinese trade surplus, contrary to the US trade deficit, by the way, has adjusted, uh, was sort of 10% of GNP uh, 10 years ago. It's now on the order of magnitude of 1% of GNP, which, by the way, shows that as predicted, trade opening has worked for everybody. Because not only does China grow, but China imports more. And the growth of imports is now higher than the growth of exports, which is why the trade surplus uh, uh, melted from a sort of 10% of GNP uh, to uh, something which is in the order of magnitude of 1%. But the US reasoning is China is good because of growth. Its growth is largely due to exports. So let's hit China where it has a weakness, where it has an Achilles heel, which is its exports. And this is roughly uh, what uh, is happening. And in my view, this is dangerous uh, because uh, the trade tensions, I usually do not like uh, the word uh, trade wars. I think I, I reserve the word war uh, for uh, armed conflicts uh, that uh, do uh, lots of victims, as often has been the case in human history. So trade tensions, in my view, in this sense, are only a sort of superstructure which reveals something uh, which is a more structural geopolitical issue, uh, which is this rivalry. Now, let me come to my... Uh, Third and the final step, we've had this good period. We've had uh, clearly a much less good period as far as uh, opening trade is concerned uh, in the last uh, five or 10 years. Uh, what about the future? And my own take on that is that uh, preserving open trade, which I think we should do because it's much more efficient to grow economies, to increase welfare, to reduce poverty. Uh, I think we, looking at the future, 
uh, we have to accept that uh, preserving open trade will uh, necessitate uh, to work uh, on uh, several fronts. First front where I think uh, action uh, is needed uh, is, uh, is in strengthening uh, the multilateral system. Starting with the multilateral trade system, not only, uh, uh, I'll come that, back to that in a minute, but starting with uh, the multilateral trade system, which is what is now uh, dubbed as WTO reform. True, and on this, I must recognize that Mr. Trump has a point. He has everything wrong in the way he thinks and acts about trade, except in one area, uh, which is that WTO needs reform. And WTO needs reform because, as I said previously, its rule book uh, dates from 1994 and has not been adjusted, updated, since which is a thing that needs to be done. And notably in uh, one uh, area uh, where there are specific uh, Chinese uh, sensitivities, uh, which is in the area of subsidization. The reality is that whereas WTO rules are reasonably strong in some areas, they are weaker in other areas, and subsidization uh, is an area where the rules of WTO are too weak. It just happened that among uh, the big uh, players on the world seed, seen uh, is China, uh, which happens to have, as I already said, a rather large state-owned sector, to the difference of other uh, major players uh, in world trade, uh, and inevitably, uh, there is a suspicion, right or wrong, that the closeness of this state-owned enterprise with the state, with public coffers, uh, creates a situation where the subsidization uh, capacity is there and sometimes translates into real subsidization, thus, thus creating to the benefit of Chinese producers on foreign markets, an unfair advantage. If and when China subsidizes its producers, this is a subsidy uh, to the cost of capital, which is a major element of competitiveness. So this is an issue which has been brewing for some time but which now uh, needs to be addressed uh, short term, as, by the way, uh, other issues which are rather urgent in uh, the reform of the dispute uh, settlement system in the WTO, which, as some of you may know, uh, has been, for the moment, uh, taken hostage uh, by the US administration. Short term, if we want to defend open trade, we have to strengthen the rules of WTO in a number of areas so that the notion that their weakness plays for others and against me is removed from uh, the discourse of some starting uh, with uh, the US. This is short term. Medium term, uh, there are a number of issues that will need to be addressed. Uh, I mentioned the relative importance of non-tariff measures, security, safety standards. This is an issue that does not pertain to WTO proper. It's not the World Trade Organization that is going to decide that we should have a worldwide pesticide residue standard. This is not in the expertise. This is not in the culture. This is not in the mandate of uh, WTO uh, uh, members for WTO, nor is it to decide whether uh, we need a single size of bumpers all over the world, uh, or whether aflatoxin in nuts or ractopamine in pork uh, is something that needs to be harmonized and how worldwide. This is nevertheless a big issue, and the international system 
will need, beyond what is done at WTO, to move to a higher level of standardization of precaution. If we want to keep benefiting from economies of scale, we have to provide producers with a high level of precaution everywhere, it being understood that to the difference of what you do with tariffs, getting rid of tariffs simple, you reduce them and there's a limit which is zero. If it's about pesticide residues, this will not work. You will not convince your parliament that in order to open trade, it's good to reduce the, to increase the pesticide residue tolerance. People will not accept a trade-off between their health and the expansion of world trade. So the only way to do that is to harmonize but upwards, and this is a very complex thing to do. Another area where uh, the WTO agenda uh, will need to adjust uh, is probably uh, the area of environment, which, as you know, uh, is uh, taking a larger, a larger part of the international agenda. In theory, there is a simple solution, uh, which is uh, rise uh, the price of carbon and market and production systems will adjust. That's the theoretical approach in a market system. We all know that a single price of carbon for the whole planet is not for tomorrow. So there has to be other ways of making sure that the expansion of economies and of world trade internalize part of the externalities uh, which today are not priced properly, hence contribute to economic development uh, damaging uh, climate. Another area uh, where uh, there is, as already mentioned, there is a big job to be done in order to try and level the playing field uh, is uh, this issue of uh, data, uh, which, as I said, for the moment is split. Uh, you roughly have uh, 800 million users of internet in China. Uh, you roughly have 500 million users of uh, internet in US, in EU. You roughly have uh, uh, 300 users in US. These 800, these 500, and these 300 do not have the same system for treating data. Can this lead to some sort of interoperability, or do we have to accept uh, that uh, we have to live in a world which is, in this sense, deglobalized, uh, is a, an open question for the future. There are other areas uh, that influence trade and trade flows and trade development, which will need to be addressed as part of the strengthening of the international system. Uh, I already uh, mentioned standardization, uh, the stabilization of the financial industry, which needs to be globally regulated so that uh, a financial crisis like the one we've known in 08 and which stem from the lack of proper regulation of the financial industry were there. We probably need to somehow reform the international monetary system. I don't think in a world which is globalized the way it is, we can very long allow the dollar to keep its, uh, its uh, supremacy. There will have to be some sort of diversification of the currency system worldwide. And we also know that even in areas of taxation, global companies do not very often pay what they should pay because they play on uh, tax optimization uh, depending on different domestic systems. This is why, for instance, the G20 has a sort of tax uh, harmonization agenda. So these issues that relate to trade and to keep trade opening will have to diversify. Uh, we uh, discussed this and published uh, last week in Brussels uh, with the uh, European uh, Federation of Progressive Think Tank, a uh, big piece, which you can find on the website of FEPS, which is a sort of compendium of how, at least on the side of progressives, uh, we need to adjust to these changes. This is part of the answer. It's not the only part of the answer. We also have to strengthen domestic systems in order to make them 
better at coping with the loser's part of the equation. We need to reconcile part of our population with the notion that open trade is good overall, and telling them that it's good for many people, too bad, that's not true for them, does not work anymore. So we have to find a solution in adjusting our social systems, whether labor market, whether training, whether education, whether unemployment benefits, whether pensions, whether a system that help restructuring part of the economy that are hit by trade opening. Uh, but this is a big challenge because if we keep having a growing part of the population that feels the victim of open trade, uh, we will not succeed in uh, regaining the ground, uh, the political ground which uh, we need to gain. Of course, this also has a lot to do uh, with uh, issues that are not specifically trade related, like the capacity of our economic system to increase our competitiveness, notably through uh, innovation. And of course, uh, finally, uh, I think uh, we have, uh, and when I say we, it's uh, more in the hands of uh, uh, US uh, and China, uh, we have to uh, carefully handle uh, this uh, to us uh, rivalry uh, in order uh, to contain it so that it does not degenerate uh, into, uh, like in previous parts of history, uh, into uh, armed uh, conflict and the use of weapons. And this is tricky uh, because the US uh, see uh, capitalism uh, with uh, US characteristics and uh, China uh, sees capitalism with uh, Chinese characteristics. And as we all know, what China calls Chinese characteristics uh, is quite different from what uh, US uh, called uh, US characteristics. And whereas for a long time, the view was that you no know, China would run its own course uh, with its Chinese characteristic, uh, and uh, US uh, would run its own course with its US characteristics, in both cases, uh, they become more assertive. The reality is that in recent times, the sort of careful handling and thing which uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, had recommended, uh, which is you grow, you grow your economy, you grow your power, but don't shout too much. That's what that's what you're doing. This is changing, and on the same on the uh, on the U.S. side, uh, the notion that the U.S. Uh, sort of exert a sort of benign leadership on the international system is changing. We clearly have, as a U.S. president, somebody who's not in favor of a benign leadership by the uh, U.S. on the world. He thinks the reality is that America should re-become what he thinks it should be, which is number one. And this tension is there, and we will need uh, to cope with that. And as a European, you will easily understand that this is a worry for me. Uh, and Europe stands uh, somewhere uh, in between uh, the sort of uh, US uh, hypercapitalist system and the Chinese uh, hyper state system. Uh, we have uh, elements of a bit of both, uh, either by tradition or by history or by ideology. Uh, but the notion that uh, US would close itself and that China would close itself and there is a risk that this happens if the US have too much of an aggressive posture, notably in the area of technology, where we know there is a tech race going on all over this planet, not just, by the way, by US and China, but also to some extent by Japan, Korea, the European Union. This is something which needs to be factored in if we want in the future to keep trade open, which leads me to my Final point, uh, before uh, the discussion uh, we will uh, now have, uh, which is whether my suggestion that if we do that, it will work, uh, is uh, valid or not. And that's an open question. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the question which I debate, 
in uh, many places, uh, which is whether or not this sort of globalization period, which has brought so many benefits to so many people, uh, is about to end or not, and whether there is, uh, we need to work or think of a serious assumption, uh, which would be uh, deglobalization. Now, my answer to that, for the moment, is no, this will not happen, uh, because I believe we've uh, reached a stage of globalization, of interpenetration of production systems, of goods and services, which is the infrastructure, and the stage of institutional integration through the international system that will be resilient to shocks like the one uh, the new uh, US uh, president is uh, creating. I think what will protect us from a damaging deglobalization uh, is uh, the level of globalization which we've reached. And this is why I'm reasonably optimistic. Uh, I don't think deglobalization will happen. And by the way, we have a rather good lab experience of a mini deglobalization in Europe with Brexit. Huh? If you look at the problem they have to remove uh, the uh, British uh, egg from the EU omelette, uh, which seems to be quite a tough thing to do, you have a notion of uh, why uh, integration is good and why integration not only would be bad, but would be very difficult. So that's my bet. At this stage, I think deglobalization will not take place, uh, but, but a number of the turbulences we are going through uh, are probably uh, there uh, to, uh, for some time. And if uh, we want to project of how globalization and open trade has to work in the world of tomorrow, uh, we have to think about one world, one planet, uh, but probably uh, with uh, three uh, different colors in a number of areas, like the world of data I just mentioned. Uh, so to use a, a Chinese parallel, uh, we may be, uh, and we probably are heading uh, to a system, uh, to a world where we have uh, one planet and three systems. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening to the Seeds Knowledge Podcast. Keep up with the latest in Chinese economic and global business trends by subscribing to the Seeds Knowledge Podcast on iTunes or through your favorite podcast app. More Seeds Knowledge available through courses at our China campuses in Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen, our Africa campus in Accra, Ghana, or our European campus in Zurich, Switzerland. Seeds is the bridge that connects the world and China.